Hello everybody, and thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to join us on this uh, webinar. And the topic we're going to be talking about today is bridging the gap between mobile and computer forensics. Um, there's three of us who are going to uh, hopefully fill the next hour with interesting conversation. So that's your speakers for the day. So my name is Paul Slater, I am the Global Head of Investigations at Nuix. I've um, been here for just under four years now. Um, my background is law enforcement and corporate investigations and spent a number of years at uh, some of the big four. Um, what I've been trying to do since I've been at Nuix is to obviously help our customers understand forensic workflows and how they can best utilise our technology. So hopefully some of my expertise will come across today and uh, you'll find some of the conversation interesting. Joining me is my uh, my colleague from Nuix, is Carl Barron. Carl, don't say hello and introduce yourself please. Yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, Carl Barron here, Senior Solutions Consultant at Nuix. Uh, been at Nuix for uh, actually coming up to five years this month, so a great uh, celebration of, of working at Nuix. So, I do everything um, technical within Nuix, so that is pre-sales, post-sales. Um, previous to working for Nuix, um, I worked for one of the leading litigation support vendors in London in their forensic lab. Thanks, Carl. We also have a very special guest uh, joining us today, uh, Matt Wotton, who is uh, the e-discovery manager for Euro Solutions. Mark, hello, and uh, just want to say hello and introduce yourself. Uh, morning, Paul. Thanks for the uh, very special guest. It's nice to know there's something like 297 people stood for this <laughs> webinar today. There's no pressure at all. Um, yeah, I would describe myself as probably a, um, a technical investigator. Um, I've gone from being in the Royal Signals, so in the British Army, through to uh, 20 years in law enforcement. Finally, working with, with Vodafone and Nigel Jeffries and Scott Simpson in their forensics lab uh, and doing many complicated and um, uh, well, many complicated investigations using mobile devices as a telecoms company, as you would guess. I've now moved on to Yara Solutions and like yourselves, I've been in your relevant post for like four years. I've been at Yara Solutions for seven days uh, <laughs> and we, we, work, we work very closely with Nuix uh, with in-house legal IP and compliance departments and uh, we're basically trying to improve operating for consulting, managed services and tech solutions. It's all very interesting and I uh, suspect it's going to be very busy, but thank you for the invite. Oh, welcome and great to have you on the webinar, Mark. It really is. What we're going to talk about today, so I hope you can see the agenda, so a little bit of introductions which hopefully we kind of got through. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a survey and a poll just to kind of get some uh, people thinking about uh, the growth of mobile devices. We'll look at mobile devices in investigations, look at some of the challenges, move on to some use cases just to put a bit of context around some of the things we've been talking about. Then we'll hand over to Carl later on to actually look at how we look at mobile devices in Nuix and hopefully there'll be lots of questions for people to uh, pose to us as part of the webinar. Um, I believe those people who are on the webinar you can actually type into the box questions. Um, Nina who is actually running this for us on behalf of Nuix is actually going to collect those and when we get towards the end we'll obviously take questions and hopefully answer those for you. So moving on, I thought before we kind of got into the main body of this really, we'd have a little bit of a quiz and people on the, on the line are obviously welcome to kind of put their thoughts into this as well. There is no prize, the prize is merely being able to answer the questions and being satisfied in your own little mind that you're good at answering questions. So guys, a question for you. What percentage of UK adults do you think now owns a smartphone? And I'm going to give you four choices here. A, 38%, B, 71%, C, 47%, and D, 68%. First one to Mark. What do you think, Mark? Um, well, working on the basis that um, my, my mum is, even has a smartphone, an iPhone, uh, I'd go probably top end at 71%. Carl, what would you say? Yeah, I, I, I've got to agree with Mark there as well, being a millennial myself. Um, yeah, I would certainly say it, 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 it is up there. Um, just to just to edge on the bets, I'm going to go with answer D though, um, 68%. So, well, you'd be wrong, Carl, and Mark, you'd be right. The actual answer is 71% of UK adults now owns a smartphone. Next question. Uh, in 2015, globally, on average, how many text messages do you think were sent? And the options are, question is A, one trillion each year, 
B, 23 billion each day, C, 10 billion each day, or D, 50 billion over the year. So it may be a couple of years old, and we appreciate technology may change a little bit, but what do you think? Well, first of all, I'll go to Carl on this one. Carl, what are you going to go for? It's going to have to be a complete guess here. Um, I'm going to go with D again. D, 50, 50 billion over 50 the year. Billion over the year, yeah. Mark? Um, for myself, um, I say I haven't just left the telecoms company, you'd hope I'd have a feel for what this would be, so I'll <laughs> go for 10 billion each day. Probably wrong, but I'll go with that. Well, you'd be both wrong, because actually the answer is B, 23 billion were sent each day. And I did a little bit of calculations before this, and that works out at approximately 8.3 trillion over the entire year which is quite a lot of text messages and actually probably quite a few of them are down to my uh, couple of daughters adding to that number. Well, that's a significant number. I would have my, second, to... my second option. <laughs> well, your daughters, yeah. Okay, third and final question before we kind of move on into the main sort of uh, body of the webinar. How many minutes on average does a smartphone user spend on their phones each day? So again, four choices to choose from. First one is A, 60 minutes, B, 145 minutes, C, 225 minutes, or D, 90 minutes. Mark, back to you. What do you think is the, uh, the answer for this one? So I'm going to go with B, 145 minutes, but based on the, on, on the fact that I'm hoping that's an average because my daughter would definitely be triple that. Okay, B and Cal? Uh, no, in my usage, I'm definitely going to have to go for the uh, C, 225 minutes. Okay. Well, the actual answer is B. The average user spends 145 minutes on their smartphone. But, Carl, you would actually fall into the above average category, which is answer C, which is 225 minutes. So the average user is spending a bit over two hours and the above average user, which is probably, again, one of our children, is falling into category C, 225 minutes. So, a bit of fun over with. Um, I think what that kind of goes to show is that you know, the rise in mobile devices and how people use and interact with them is has changed, really. And hopefully on the screen you can see um, a bit of a ticking clock going on. Um, what this is kind of demonstrating, and this is this is a, a screen capture taken by me of a live feed from a website that provides these statistics. Um, just a bit of a window into you know, what is actually going on, well, live when it was taken over mobile devices. So you can see since I started kind of talking about this slide, um, 27 million emails have been opened on a mobile device. Over 9, 10 million now text messages have been sent. People have been happily Snapchatting almost to the tune of half a million Snapchats. Instagram, not as popular, but still 53, 54,000 uh, pictures have been uploaded to Instagram. And those people who are at work and should be doing, or should be knowing better, have actually done at least 2 million Facebook videos have been watched on mobile devices since we've actually started talking. Now this goes on for three minutes and I'm not going to obviously let it run for three minutes but again I think one of the, the, the observations to take away from this is that most people now are using mobile devices significantly more and more and the number of services and the number of applications that are actually on these devices is increasing. Mark, do you have any comments on this one? Is this, uh, are you part of this uh, mobile statistic that we're seeing on the screen? Yeah, definitely, without, without a doubt. I think it's an interesting um, statistic anyway, because it shows that every piece of information that's being recorded on your device here is, all, you know, is also being recorded physically on the device and is, will leave the artifacts and information for the, uh, the majority of the people who are listening to this to be able to forensically recover and use either in you know, law enforcement um, investigations and ultimately criminal proceedings, but also into civil litigation and, and, and litigation in general. So you, know, you can come at different angles, all these devices and all these smartphones are constantly recording your every movement, where your location is, etc. Yep, and in the two minutes and 17 seconds, we're now up to 93 million emails and over 30 million text messages. Pretty impressive, really. But I guess the big question here is, what does all this have to do with investigations? And 
I think when they start looking at uh, mobile devices a little bit more, well, most of us, probably all of us on this uh, on this webinar, are, you know, are, are now aware that many of the smart devices automatically add geotagging information to our photographs. And you know, one of the, the, the I guess the consequences of this is when we actually take a photograph on a mobile device, we can actually now see quite easily where people have been. And it's, you know, it's very simple to look at the picture and see in relation to that where that picture was taken. But when we, we actually look even just on the mobile device itself and we look at the information that is presented to the user on that device, we can see, um, as you can see on the screen now, we can see where they were there and we can pull out some information. So for example, you, you know, Google has, has very kindly plotted this on a map for me. I can see information around the camera that was used or the smartphone that was used where the picture was taken, when the picture was taken, and some you know, geolocational information actually pinpoints the actual photograph to a place on the map. And when we look at that a little bit deeper, and we actually take that information and we actually look at the, I guess, the forensicness around that, and we look at the, the metadata that's being stored against a particular image on the mobile device, we can actually start to see a wealth of information that's been presented to us and I've put on the screen here just some of that information but we can see things like the resolution we can see whether the flash was switched on or not we can look at the white balance setting for example there's, there's a significant amount of information here that is actually being presented to us the camera make and model all that kind of stuff really and from an investigative perspective this is actually quite powerful because it enables us to you know, not just look at, for example, where a picture was taken, but we can actually look at it and sometimes we can see who was actually taken on that picture. Now, those smart-eyed people on the screen will see that that picture is actually shown in the middle of Birmingham and I'm actually wearing a short sleeve shirt. So I'll leave that with you as to uh, whether that's an accurate representation of life in Birmingham. Mark, Carl, do you have any well. comments? Uh, yes, Mark. I was just going to say on Hi, on that on that stance, the um, you know there's four people in the picture, and I no doubt that um, all four people will have um, smartphones or mobile devices of some sort, you know, carrying around an iPad with them or an iPhone or an Android yeah. device. So actually, there, there's four separate areas for for obtaining information. But one interesting thing, in, particularly in relation to the EXIF data and data in general, is that, say, for example, on a work on the premise that they're using iPhones, if yep. they were to share an, an image between each other, that image would change file name, it would change quite significant amount of metadata if it was airdropped or messaged, because uh, Apple do reduce in size by about 80% or 70% the, the actual photo quality. What doesn't change is the EXIF data, so the location data, what was what kind of camera it was taken on. So uh, a naive, or I won't say naive, but a, a less experienced investigator may look at the picture and say that was definitely taken there on this device at that time, but actual fact it wasn't, it was taken on somebody else's device, so you've got to marry up the, the metadata yeah. that you, are, you, know, you established there. Yeah, agreed. I mean, there's an interesting point. As you said, there's four people in that picture, and you know, I, I can tell you that there were four different pictures taken, actually. So we have, you know, we have that kind of correlation with people at that location at that time, and you know, quite clearly, you can you can put people together. So it, it isn't just looking at the, I guess there's two layers here. You know, one layer is looking at what the the data tells us, but actually, we can look at the picture, and sometimes. And, and we can talk about it a little bit later, but sometimes what's in the picture is actually more powerful than the metadata behind it. You know, I think we've all done in, in our histories jobs where, you know, for example, stereotypical, we, we, you know, there's a drugs job and there's a picture of the suspect stood next to his his cannabis plant or whatever it may well be. You know, and that can be really quite compelling evidence. And if we look at this a little bit deeper. Because most smartphones actually track our physical movements, and whether that's done overtly or covertly, um, you know, Apple, for example, might again. One of the things now is find my friends, and you can see where people are if, if that if information is opened up. But we also know from either doing it ourselves or reading things in the press that a lot of these devices are constantly recording information around you know, where they are in the world, what they're connecting to. That allows us to effectively look a little bit deeper and we can actually start to see where people have been 
and by looking at information that's recovered either from the mobile device itself or maybe from the network provider we can actually look at things like cell tower analysis and now we can we can actually correlate that picture that that phone and we can actually see where people have been on the streets and where they've actually gone to I think Paul if I can just um, make one comment there um, in, relation, in relation to the uh, cell tower analysis, yeah, you, you, you're right. Obviously, the, the telecoms providers will provide information, particularly in the UK, if it comes under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. Uh, so you can actually request that cell tower information for law enforcement type investigations. Um, I suppose when you get into the civil litigation, you don't have that capability. You can't use it for civil matters. But what, what you can do and what it comes on most, I would say, corporate type phones are applications such as um, SOTI or AirWatch, which actually allows um, the management team or the admin team for that corporate um, entity to manage the devices which are held by their staff always with that little caveat of there is no no expectation of uh, privacy if you're going to use this this device so you can probably remote lock that device you can remove the password for it and even remote wipe it uh, if you needed to so yeah even though it's a corporate device it's still a good source of information if you had an investigation and the don't get me wrong the terms and conditions and the um, the privacy and everything is is all looked at yeah and Carl yeah. you were saying yeah just just something to add there Paul as well um, just going back to kind of your previous slide and this slide in front of us here, I think it's very important to understand is a lot of people kind of understand the fact that their phone tracks them when they take a photograph. Um, Apple do a great job of visualizing this, showing you where a photograph was taken, creating um, snapshots of moments of where you were and things like that, making cool videos and th things like that. What people don't realize is what, what a lot of people realize is you can turn that off. So I would suspect most, most sort of suspects will actually look at turning that off. But this type of information in front of you routing cell towers and Wi-Fi networks and things like this, if you want to use your phone, this has to be on. So for people actually using their phones, although they turn the, the, the tracking off for the images, this information in front of us, the cell tower analysis and the Wi-Fi networks, will actually keep tracking them. So Turning it off for the images is one thing, but using the cell tower analysis and actually using the Wi-Fi networks allows you to actually start tracking people without their knowledge on the devices. A oh, good point. Thank you for raising that, Cal. Um, I think so. We, we kind of agree. Or hopefully, we agree that you know, there's, obviously, there's a lot of useful information that uh, we can probably get from mobile devices, but there are some challenges and I, and I think from my own personal experiences I'd be keen to hear yours as well um, Mark and Carl but forensic acquisition is is slow and it is costly and it is a challenge and if you look at the bottom right many of us in our careers have walked into a room full of hundreds of computers and kind of thought oops I've got some challenges here as to how we're going to effectively capture from all of these devices and you know, maybe back in back in my day, we, we would have a trusty boot disk, and we would, we would go into the room with computers, and we would pull out the boot disk, and we would you know, effectively use the device it's, uh, itself to make a copy. Well, I think from what from what I've seen and from my experiences, that that is not the kind of thing we can do with mobile devices. And if we look at you know whatever technology that people choose to use to actually take some kind of capture from a mobile device. You know, there's a lot of products on the market and we can talk about them and Carl, I'm sure you'll touch on some of those a little bit later on when we look at how we do that in Newix. What, what is pretty consistent here is pretty much irrespective of which of the, of the technologies you use, it is almost a one-to-one -one relationship. So you're using one device to look at one phone and that effectively means that you know, the time it's going to take to take the acquisition is going to spend, you're going to spend a lot of time. and. I've put some figures on the screen here, and you know, anecdotally, an iPhone six, an iPhone 64 gig can take six hours to uh, to do a forensic acquisition. Does, and, and I guess the other thing to consider here is what what level of extraction we're going to do, as how long it's going to take, and you know, if, if there, there are different ways to get information off mobile devices. And there's different technologies to do that, but we've got to consider, and we've got to consider from a perspective of, um, I guess, proportionality and time, which of these approaches we're going to take. Mark or Carl, do you have any observations on this one? I think 
I think again, Mark from here. Um, from from my perspective here, I think it's the the phrase sledgehammer to crack a nut. Uh, and I, you know, I was brought when I came through Vodafone working with Nigel. That's one thing that we realised that you have to have a number of tools in the box. So I would say there's no one tool that does everything fantastic. But collectively, if you can use the different software solutions out there, then then yeah, you can get things in very quick. So a logical image of some some devices using some technologies actually you can do in a matter of seconds and and I would say most of the time that probably fits in in a technology a technology based investigation because you, you're ultimately looking for the did they do it did they send that image is that on their phone that kind of thing but when you get more into the physical and the deleted data that 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 becomes more of a I would say a little bit more of a minefield but yeah there's there's a lot of software solutions and it's how you know my interest in this is how you can ingest that into Nuix let's say okay that's that's cool so I think just uh, whilst we're talking about that as well, I mean, it is difficult. And I think if we, we, we kind of look at that, you know, there are two now main technologies on the market. There's, there's Android and there's Apple. And I think each of those devices presents uh, the forensic examiner with its own challenge. I mean, if we look at uh, Apple, for example, in the first instance, trying to get information off an Apple device, well, uh, reading from the website, and hopefully you can see this on the screen now, if you've got a device which is running iOS 8 or later, um, Apple are saying that it, you know, your personal data is placed under the protection of your passcode. For all devices running iOS 8 and later, Apple will not perform data extraction in response to government search warrants because the files to be extracted are protected by an encrypted key which is tied to the user's passcode, which Apple does not possess. So effectively what they're saying is if you don't have the passcode, then don't send it back to us because we're not going to help you. And we'll, we'll, you know, there's lots of things in the press at the moment, which I'm sure we've all seen around particular phones in particular sensitive investigations where other technology have had to be used to try and pull information from them. I think, Paul, with just with that, that's why you're sorry to interject, but um, no, I think with the with the inclusion now of iOS 10 and the implication that comes from that and, and the fact that things are locked down to certain folders on, on, on particularly on, on laptops for example I think it's, it's having that ability and I think you're going to come on to it shortly of, of being able to find other locations to where that data could reside um, but I think that yeah you know it's not an Apple unique thing I think that Android's now you know with a Gmail backup you know, they're, they're locking devices that ultimately if you don't know the pin to get in it it becomes what for want of a better word, a house brick. You're not going to be able yep. to use it for anything else unless the the person with the admin rights over that iOS account can actually unlock and remove it from the, for want of a better word, Find My Friends application. Yep. And you know the, the information I'm seeing when I'm doing some research on this is, you know, physical uh, acquisition, well, jailbreaking, kind of, you know, there's no current jailbreak for the latest version of iOS, and there are certain criteria that the phone has to match for that to work anyway. And if we look at things, as you said, Mark, around you know, doing things like logical acquisitions, well, again, if a passcode is known, and that, that's a, a good question, do we know the passcode? You know, investigators Nick, can now cause the device to produce an offline backup via iTunes. And again, that backup, which is typically produced to a, a, a computer, can be analyzed with some restrictions. So there's a little bit of way around that. And the final one, which I think is quite interesting, is, is iCloud. Um, and I understand that backups are incremental and occur automatically every time that the device is locked, charging, and connected to a known Wi-Fi network. And all conditions must be must be met for that to happen. So potentially there's a you know there's a, there's a, a an easier solution there if if we have a, an iPhone or an iDevice which is connected to the iCloud. I'd, I'd agree, Paul. Just one thing. I'd agree with that as well. But just going back to the, you know, you take possession of that or you seize what is going to ultimately be an exhibit for court or for litigation at a later stage. You know, look at simple things like a pattern analysis on the front of the screen. Do they have a Z as their unlock, which is probably half the people that are listening to this. I've just given out your password. Um, the, um, so th little things like that. But yeah, I would definitely say, you know, you, 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 in modern phones, modern smartphones, you're not going to be able to get into them uh, without the keys to the safe, as it were. But that's yeah. why it's really important to, to look for other things such as passwords kept on uh, on laptops, passwords kept in the cloud on other on Gmail backups and the notes section of, of a, an iPad, for example. And always remembering, and I'll come on to a little later, that if if you buy into the concept of Apple, you probably buy into their whole concept. So you'll have an iPhone, an iPad, an iTouch, an iMac, a MacBook Pro. Actually, you probably find you might not need the phone because everything will be backed up on something else. Yeah, 
So I guess what the thing is, it's about thinking around the problem as well there a little bit and not just focusing on the device, but looking at, as you say, if you, if you bought into the, the kind of Apple ecosystem, looking at the other the other things that are connected to that. Yeah. The other side, the other side of the coin, of course, is uh, is the Android world, and I understand that Samsung has a policy, an official policy, to support information extraction when serving a government request. So, if you are in law enforcement or you're in government and you have a, a Samsung device, you may be in luck. However, it's probably worth noting that Android is an incredibly fragmented platform with lots of lots of different device types, hundreds of manufacturers and thousands of devices on the market. So whilst the possibility of it being a Samsung is quite high, it probably could also be something else. And I guess a lot of that also depends on where in the world you are and what devices are quite prominent in that part of the world. We can also look at doing physical acquisitions of Android devices. Um, again, I think it becomes a little bit more of a minefield here where success can depend on a lot of factors, including the make and the model, the carrier, what the user's settings are, whether it's rooted, what the lock status is, whether there's a PIN code and it's known, or whether USB debugging is switched on or not. But I think the, the the bottom line there is if you don't, you know, you won't know until you try. So the possibility is give it a go and see how you get on. We also have things like uh, JTAG forensics, which is effectively pulling the thing apart and connecting to uh, the test uh, the test ports to access a raw effectively a raw image of, or a raw data on the device and that often works I believe when we're talking about locked or damaged devices but an interesting point to note is that if the device is encrypted then the process will produce an encrypted image so we, we can get a copy but potentially can't look at it Final thing, I guess, on this one is looking at chip off, and I, I'm not sure if anybody has any real experience on the, on doing chip off. I mean, I certainly have never got to that degree of uh, of destructiveness to actually do that acquisition. But there are techniques out there to effectively desolder the chips and take them off and read them using specialist hardware to get their contents. And the good thing here is, is is encryption. You know, if it's not been enabled, then effectively this process will produce. A full binary image, which will include obviously any unallocated space. I think, I think uh, with that, Paul, just uh, just to, to back up with that is the fact that you know I'm I'm on, I'm on here as a, a technical investigator, uh, you know, who uses forensics uh, where, where I can to, to to progress cases. But I would say that there, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said try it. You don't know. And Scott yeah. Simpson, who I know will be listening to this, you know, that we've had many many cases where it says USB debugging is enabled, and you try and take an extract of the device, and it won't let you. And it's it's the flaws and uh, the background mechanisms that's in place for that operating system because it changes so quickly to keep up with that type of technology. You have to keep your finger on the pulse constantly. So to the chip off technology, yes, it's not something I've ever done. And I know there's people out there that do it and I would rely on you know, hardware technical experts because they're yeah. the people that ultimately they can then outline to a core if there's changed data, they can be confident and explain why it was changed, how it was changed. So you stick within the principles of you know digital forensics. Yeah, yeah. And, and just touching on the last point on this slide before we move on is People also do their own backup. So, if, you know, for some rooted devices, there is a process where you can get the device to do an, and, an Android backup, which again will give you a, a something to potentially work with. But I think what I'm, I guess, the point of all of this is that there is a lot of different things to consider here, and a lot of different gotchas potentially in the process to actually get information off the device. And that kind of brings us on to the third kind of challenge that certainly I've come across in my kind of time is that computers and mobile devices uh, are, are often examined separately and you'll you'll attend a, a crime scene or a corporate investigation and typically the computers will go to the computer lab and the phones will go to the phone labs and what that typically ends up with is two sorts of reports and you'll end up with a report from a computer or a report from the computers and similarly a, a different batch of reports from the mobile devices and one of the challenges with that kind of thinking is that if you look at these two sets of systems in their own isolation, it makes it really or almost impossible to kind of identify and bring this and look at it together as one one holistic investigation. And you know, 
if you're looking at what's on the computer separate to what's on the mobile device, it's really quite difficult to actually try and bring these two things together and see effectively what's happened and who was where, when, why, what, and what happened. So moving on, what has all this got to do with Nuix, I guess, is a, is a question here. And uh, those who've, who've been following what we've been doing for a number of years will be quite familiar with this, with this slide now. Um, we've been talking for a very long time now around, you know, only when you look at all the devices at the same time will we actually start to see the complete picture. And there is good news, um, and this has been good news for a long time, in that within our own technology, we actually do have support for the main, in primary, the main uh, mobile device solution. So we can take a Celebrite uh, extraction, we can load that in, we can take an X or Y extraction, we can load that in. Similar with Oxygen, we can load the data in. We can also do things like BlackBerry backups and um, with the latest release of uh, Nui 7.2, we can actually now um, look at getting iCloud connections and bringing data from the iCloud. So hopefully with that kind of in mind, we can actually start to think around using our technology as a single pane of glass viewing to all of the data. And whilst we're not quite at the minority report level just yet, we do have the ability to bring all this information together. And, and Carl, I think you're going to demonstrate this when we get to you, to the to that section of the of the webinar. We can actually start to look at, for example, what happened on the device and looking around, pivoting on location or by time, and bringing into that investigation other sources of intelligence or evidence. So looking at what was going on perhaps in a, a, a kilometer's distance of an incident or an event and looking at Wi-Fi, looking at mobile uh, cell phones or actually looking at the physical devices to see who was there, what was happening and what was going on. And when we look at that a little bit deeper within things like web review, we can actually start to look at things like timelines and we can actually start to map out all these different sources of intelligence and, and evidence. And really, we can start to bring this together to see effectively a timeline of a sequence of events. And because we're looking at all the devices at the same time, we're not looking at these things in isolation. We can actually start to see, for example, you know, mobile devices and interactions with computers and, and all those other sorts of evidence and bringing that all together. Which brings me nicely onto some case studies. And obviously, I've talked a little bit now about some of the theoretical stuff here. But um, Mark, if you've uh, had some time to just talk about some actual kind of real world case studies for us. So the first one, if you'd like to just give us a bit of a, a broad overview of uh, an expenses for that you dealt with. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, so the, the, the three cases that I'm going to mention, they're, they're quite simple in, in context. Um, but you know, just to give people a flavour of the type of things that you can do, because I'm you know, also make an assumption that a lot of the people listening maybe don't do their own investigations, but are forensics, um, you know, through and through. So this, on this case, we had uh, somebody who had been submitting expenses for driving um, multiple multiple miles, hundreds of miles, on a weekly basis, uh, and we're putting them expenses through and being paid them, and we're talking several thousand pounds. Okay. Um, when we managed to do the investigation, we noted that not only did the phone have um, location data not putting them at where they said they were going to be, where they were supposed to be and they were being paid to travel to, but actually we were able to cross-reference the information that they had on their mobile phone, so the location data, and then look at that in isolate, look at that against the location of the laptop uh, and the location, whether or not they were booking in and out of work, uh, whether they were booking into work on, on, on the, the VPN, uh, so the private yep. network for work. Uh, and, and from it, we were able to show that actually they weren't where they claimed to be, and, and, and thus prove the fact that they, you know, they did commit first of all a criminal act of fraud, but ultimately yeah. gross gross misconduct within the, the civil litigation area. Um, what I would say in the, in the learning from this one was that just because the phone isn't where it says it was, it, you know, you've got to make sure that you look at all the other fields because it may be that, that the phone wasn't with that person at that time, and you've got yeah. to show who was holding that phone at that particular time. So that's a nice simple case. Yeah, and, and I guess this, the, the, you know the the thing to to take away from that is really is that again you've got to look at it as a bigger picture, right? You've got to look at the you know the holistic view of all the all the sorts of evidence and you know use your expertise to actually draw the conclusion of what what's really happened. Yeah, so basically don't enter into it with a narrow field of view. Always enter into yeah. any investigation with a, a, a full view of everything that could possibly have taken place, and then narrow down on the evidence that's going to prove your case. Basically, cool. Okay, so the second one, Mark, is a. Uh, 
an investigation, I believe you did, relating to WhatsApp. Yeah, so uh, WhatsApp, um, I, I do love WhatsApp. I think it's one of them things that uh, people are under the misnomer that it's all encrypted end-to-end -end and, and ultimately you're not normally interested in the middle bit, which is the end-to-end -end bit as it were. You're interested yeah. in the information that you can get off of a particular personal mobile phone uh, and the you know, different software solutions will provide you a different GUI, so a different user interface to be able to see what's, what's been deleted and what's not. And on this particular example, it, it fitted really nicely. Somebody had deleted their WhatsApp message uh, but shown within the WhatsApp messages were pictures, uh, banking information, and ultimately the information that led to show the fraud was taking place. And during yeah. you know interviews, it was it was it was very good to be able to show that that not just the interaction from the one device. So um, if, if if you were looking at three suspects, as long as I've got suspect number one's mobile phone, I'll get the interactions to and from suspect one and two. I don't necessarily need number twos at that time, as long as I can corroborate that that evidence was going to and from that that mobile platform. Um, but yeah, that's I think that's just a good example of it. And you know, WhatsApp. I would say when we went earlier to how many text messages are sent globally around the world, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I would actually say that probably more people WhatsApp or iMessage. So it comes with your data bundle rather than your your SMS platform bundle. And, and you'd be right. I mean, I, I, I don't. I didn't actually show that statistic, but uh, the WhatsApp is currently the uh, the number one um, technology for doing that communication. So, yep, a good spot. I think it's a uh, forensic investigator or a technical investigator's dream WhatsApp. Um, uh, I think <laughs> hopefully it'll be around for a long time. Well, ho hopefully, and uh, hopefully it will continue to uh, provide, as you say, rich sources of uh, information, intelligence, and evidence, really. So the, the third one, Mark, is uh, one you wanted to talk about where you're looking at linking activity across different devices and platforms. Yes, yeah, so I, I briefly mentioned this earlier. So on this, um, on this particular case, it's trying to, to look at things again with a broad view. So um, I had an investigation where an iPad, a phone, and an iTouch were all examined. Uh, and when we were trying to cross-link the communications information with the iPhone, it didn't quite marry up. The information wasn't quite right. And, and actually what they'd done is they deleted the um, call data and internet history off of the phone, and we were not able to recover it. However, unbeknown to them, they had the hands-off um, the hands-off feature within the iPhone um, activated. So that was actually recording the internet history and the um, the call data and the the iMessage history on the other devices that were linked to it. Um, okay. And most people know it's there and know you can do it because they use it. It's a uh, it gives a seamless Apple experience. I think is what they call it. But um, uh, actually, you know, again, it's that look outside the box. Just because it's not on one device doesn't mean it's on the other two that may not be as password protected as the first one was. Uh, a, good, a, good, a good observation. And uh, I guess what that probably just makes you think about a little bit is that most users probably use the device in default mode. And if these things are switched on by default, then you know, people being people will probably leave them on unless there is a, you know, a nefarious reason for them to turn them off. Totally agree. It's, as Carl mentioned earlier, the um, the location data is on by default. So I get in my car in the morning and the first thing it says is, are you going to work? This is where you work. This is how long it's going to take to get there. You know, it's it's, it's constantly picking up and taking information from any source that you, you, are, you are able to provide it with. Cool. So having kind of come to the point where we're, we're in, I think we're in agreement that this is a, a useful thing and an important thing to look at. I guess the next part of the, the webinar is to actually think about, well, how do we do this or how can we use mobiles and look at it within Newick? So at this point, I'm going to try and hand across to Carl. Um, I'm going to see if it's something I can do from here and hopefully can give Carl the presenter rights. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. You're welcome. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Matt, for your, for your comments as well. I appreciate that. Excellent. So, um, as Paul says, uh, my job today is to show you how Newex presents this data. We don't have a lot of time to cover this information today, and I'll try my very best to get through all of the things I want to show you. Uh, but what we're going to start with is we're going to start with the Newex uh, workbench. Uh, I'm going to show you some things around how we can link devices together. Um, then we're going to look at some geolocational data, how we can view that, how we can show that. We're then going to switch over to our web review product, where I'm going to show you some dashboards, show you some visualizations in our web review product. So to kick this off, I just want to show you in my current UX case, up at the top, top left corner here, we have multiple devices 
all um, part of an individual case. So these individual devices all started as single investigations, but what I've done is I've joined them all together because I want to find out the context. I want to see how these people know each other, but not only that, how their devices are linked together. This could be uh, mobile devices, this could be iCloud backups, this could be Gmail backups, this could be Google Drive content, this could be forensic images. We're joining all of this data together so we can start looking at it as a single pane of glass. So what I can see straight away is if I come into the workbench here, Newx provides us with many different filters. So if we want to see all of the voice, the phone calls, we can simply see that, we can simply filter that. Again, this is working across all of the data and all of the data which we've got in this case. No matter where that data is extracted from, it's going to be taken across all of these different devices. We can start analyzing all of this information as if it's one. But what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit um, around how we can link these devices together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Newex to pull out all of the phone numbers within this case. All of these phone numbers go across all of these different evidence sets. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to select some of the mobile phone numbers within this case, simply selecting a few of those different mobile phone numbers. What I'm going to ask Newex to do is I'm going to ask Newex to visualize those phone numbers. So where do those phone numbers appear? Who do they belong to and what piece of evidence are they found in? So I can see straight away we've got a, ma a map of different piece of evidence within the case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Newex just to simply put this into islands based on the evidence type. And what we can start seeing here is we can start seeing some mobile phone numbers associated with pieces of evidence. So we can see here we've got a mobile phone number here which is connected to Ben Johnson's phone. But the one that's interesting is this mobile phone number in the middle here. This mobile phone number is connected to the call logs, which might have been taken from a mobile phone provider, just a list of call records. Also, that phone number appears in an iCloud, actually in a presentation. It appears on multiple different phones, including John, uh, Ben Johnson's phone as contacts under Trevor, and also Joe Bloggs' phone and uh, under the G Drive as well. So what we're doing here is instead of investigating these parts in a siloed environment, we're actually joining this all together. We're seeing how these are connected based on certain entities or certain parts of this case. What I can also do is as I can also see how these devices are connected based on the contacts. Who do these people know and do they have those uh, connections in common? So for this instance, I just want to visualize all of the contacts. So if I filter based on contacts, I can see all of the contacts over all of my devices. What I can ask Newex to do is simply show all of those contacts in a visual way. So Newex will pull out all of the contacts. It will create me some custom links between these items and we can start seeing the links appearing. So if I quickly zoom into this area over here on the right hand side, I can see there's a link automatically appearing here showing me that one contact is linked based on the phone number here. But what I'm really interested in is understanding how these people know each other. So I can see two different colors. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask Newix to separate these two devices. So we can see here we have John Smith's phone and we have Ben Johnson's phone. What I wanna do is I wanna focus on the piece of evidence which I can see that are linked in the center. So I'm just gonna remove some of the contacts that are just featured on individual phones. And what I've asked Newex to do is actually just show me the items that are available to me. So these ones here, just zoom in to see these items here. We can see here there's a couple of different um, points here. We can see here we have an individual called Trevor, two individuals called Trevor on Ben Johnson's phone. But we have the same person or the same contact named something different on John Smith's phone. So we can see here, actually Trevor is referenced as T-Dog on John Smith's phone. If we investigated this case in a siloed environment, we would never understand how this uh, connection was ever made, how John Smith and Ben Johnson know these individuals and how they're connected between the two. What I also want to show you today is how we can visualize geolocational information. So within UX, we now contain online and offline maps. So what we can do is we can start visualizing this data. So you can see on my screen here, I've visualized all of this information. That could be cell tower information, that could be Wi-Fi networks, that could be EXIF data taken from images. 
what I can do is I can start drilling in. So I can actually start looking through all of this information. It doesn't matter where this information comes from. All of these different devices on the top left hand side are now visualized and start showing me in a map. What I actually want to do is I want to start drilling into this map. What I'm interested in is understanding all of the people who were present or who have been to the Madison Square Garden in New York. What I can actually do in UX now is if I see something that I'm interested in, I can right click and I can then pull in all of the items within a certain radius of a point on a map. So for this instance, I want to find all of the items within a three kilometer radius of the Madison Square Garden. If I click OK, UX will automatically pull out all of those items. And again, those items are not only the EXIF information from photographs. So you can see here we've got some photographs which have been taken at the Madison Square Garden. But they're also the locational records. So people have been in that location, the cell tower masts, the potential Wi-Fi connections within that location. And what we've done automatically is brought all of this evidence into one central pane. And we can start putting people in the same location at the same time. So if I filter that based on dates here, we can see here all of these different phones. So Joe Bloggs, John Smith and Sarah Roberts were all in the Madison Square Garden at the same time. We can see here that these photographs by John Smith were taken across multiple different days, ranging from 2015, April, all the way to the 23rd of February, 2017. So multiple different points within this data we can start visualizing. So start using these visuals to actually start tailoring an investigation, bringing people together and actually putting them in the same location. We can pivot around time as well. We can pivot around location. We can bring people together. What I want to do quickly, just to finish off, is actually show you how this data looks in the WebReview product. Um, WebReview allows you a web-based, user-friendly access to a UX case. So as soon as you've indexed data in UX, you can start visualizing and start looking at this data in a web browser. And this web browser can either be online or it can be offline. And you can open this up to anybody you would like. So you can give people permissions to log into this system. You can have multiple people all accessing the same data at the same time. So if I just simply open up the same case in WebReview, in my web browser here, I'm greeted with a, a simple screen to start searching across this data. This is exactly the same case that you've just seen in Workbench. What I may want to do is I may want to start looking at a dashboard. So as soon as I come into this data, let's visualize this. Let's see how this looks. So I'm going to run a search across all of this data because I want to visualize all of the data. And what NUX is going to do, it's automatically going to populate all of this data on a very easy to use and easy to view dashboard um, visualization here. So on the left hand side, we can see all of the information, the different piece of evidence which have been added to this case. On the right hand side, we've got a link analysis showing the links between the individuals. So we can see here there's links between three of the main suspects, Sarah, Joe, and John. We can see that visual of the map down the right hand side. We can see where the data is mainly uh, found within. And we've also got a timeline. The great thing with these dashboards is they are completely customizable and they can be saved depending on the use case. So if I, if I want to move things around, I simply can. I can add additional visuals to this view as well. What I want to do is I want to start looking at this data in a little bit more detail. I can start using our new workflow functionality to start finding items which are relevant. So if I wanted to see all of the installed applications across all of my devices, I can get NUX to run the search for installed applications. It automatically changes my view in the center. I can then start looking through all of the installed applications across all of my different devices. So if I'm interested in which users in this case have access to this application, well, let's quickly do a, a search like that and we can find these items straight away and we can start visualizing these items. If I want to look at call logs, I can simply start looking at call logs in exactly the same way. Run a search for call logs using the buttons on the left hand side. It automatically changes my view in the center. We can now see the from, the to, the duration, if it was an outgoing or inbound call, as you can see on the screen here. Taking a step to a more visual representation of this data, I can actually start looking through this in a more visual timeline based style investigation. So I've plotted all of the call logs, which you can see behind onto a timeline. If I click through this visualization, 
take note of what's actually happening behind the visualization. Just move it to the right hand side a little bit more. What it's actually doing is it's automatically querying based on my interaction with this visualization. So I'm starting to drill into this data without having to run any searches, any additional searches to the typical search of show me all of the call logs. I can now see all of the data for the time frame June 2012 on a visual map. If I wanted to see a certain date, I can simply select that certain date. Nurex will automatically show me all of the call communication on that date. And I can then start looking at, okay, well, who was talking on that date? And Nurex will automatically populate a visual representation of the communication patterns and trends for that date. So using our web interface, using the visual representations of the data to fully start, to fully start investigating the data that's in front of you. Just going to switch back to Paul, just to finish off with the summary. If you do want to see any more of the actual interfaces of Nuix, feel free to reach out to, to somebody um, within Nuix, and we'd be more than happy to schedule additional demonstrations regarding the technical ability of Nuix with mobile devices. So, Carl, Paul, thank you. Good. Thank you very much for that. And, and, and may I just say thank you for having the courage to do that as a live demo as well, because uh, <laughs> I would... <laughs> it's always I would not have... more interesting when it's live. I would not have liked to have done that live, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do that live. Um, no Paul, can I just ask you. Carl one very good question? You may. I know we're tight on time, but the, the one thing, obviously, I work for Yeah, and we offer different services, managed services, technology solutions, so we're always looking to see the best product on the market for the right company we work with. So, Carl, this is probably more for yourself because you work in the background of all of this, is what do you say that this solution would offer that other software providers don't? What's the difference? What's the thing that makes it stand out in your eyes? I've got to say the scalability and the collaboration. Um, Nuix is actually bred to deal with vast amounts of data. We are typically seeing terabytes, petabytes worth of information indexed with Nuix. For us, bringing in hundreds of mobile devices into a single case is not a problem. And I think that's what really uh, is the main differentiator between us and, and, and a lot of our competitors um, in, in, in similar sort of areas. We also offer that collaboration, so using that web review system. So actually opening up our Nuix investigations, our Nuix cases to non-technical people with very little training, I think that really sets us aside from a lot of our competitors as well. That's great. Thanks very much. No a good question. Thank you for asking that, by the way. Um, so we are almost out of time, and I just thought it would be useful just to kind of summarise the things we talked about. So without going through all the things on the slide, but I think we'd all agree that mobile device usage is growing and obviously investigators are already prepared, but they need to be prepared for what's coming, especially as the technology kind of gets smarter and cleverer and bigger and faster and all those other good things. Some of the current methodologies and tools do make it lengthy and I think we've kind of touched on the fact that really to understand what's really going on in, in an investigation you need to look at the complete picture to see everything that's actually happening and we've, we've obviously talked around you know Nuix's support and we, one, of, one of our key strengths I think is that we, we're trying to be agnostic in what we do here and you know we, we will work with all of the mobile providers that we we, we, we do currently and obviously new ones more than welcome and I think we're, we're looking to collaborate with some of the more um, newer technologies or some of the technologies that we're not currently working with just to ensure that from our customers perspective that we're, you know, we're touching all the right or you know, taking all the, right, all the right boxes for them. Um, and Carl you demonstrated very well the ability to kind of link things together so looking at obviously you know, people and objects and where they were and the events that they revolved around and one of the things you know the final point really is that you know, to reduce mobile device processing backlogs this kind of approach really is, is all around you know, looking at how can we get quicker results from this and you know, rather than spending lots of time looking at every single piece of evidence is things like using some of the analytics that we have here to uh, quickly identify what's going on and you know, perhaps some of the more, the more key artifacts that are, are relevant to a case. Um, the, no, I'd just like to say I, on that last part uh, I totally agree with that aspect. I think ultimately nowadays there's that much data and there's that much information. Investigators working in anywhere be it let's say Vodafone or let's say in any corporate organisation you need to know the answer to the questions very quickly. Uh, so it's the speed at which you can process the information and get the answer that can enable you to make risk-based decisions. I think that is the overarching key thing for me out of all of this. Thank you very much. And on the hour, unfortunately, I'm not sure if we have time for any questions. Um, 
I guess, I guess what we can do is we can obviously collate any questions that have come up on the webinar and we will obviously share our responses to those questions via the appropriate uh, medium. But uh, if I just take time to say, Matt, thank you very much for taking time out of your incredibly busy day to spend it with us and to uh, give us some of your thinking and your insights into uh, mobile devices and especially how you and uh, Eura are uh, looking to kind of solve some of these problems for the customers. And again, as always, Carl, thank you for... Uh, providing uh, the real kind of touch as to how we look at this within our own technology and through uh, making this come to life for everybody. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for everybody who's actually spent the hour with us and hope it's been useful and we look forward to your questions and to doing this again soon. Thank you very much everybody. Thanks Paul. Thanks everybody. Thank you Paul.